All right, God, I just thank you for Mirko. I thank you for his willingness to do this, to come and share. And even though I say he does so much for the camp and all these other ministries in the area, God, I just thank, thank you for his willingness to come and share with us this morning. I pray you use the message that he's been working on over this past week or so. And that uh, whatever you would have um, for us today, we, we just, that would stand out to us and we'd reflect on that, not just today, but also over this next while, over the week and this month. And you know, thank you for this message, God. And I pray you just help help him speak it and if say if there's any nerves or anything like that you just calm that as well and just give him peace but thank you god amen, amen. All, right. all right i think i hit the on button yep good good morning everyone come on there Give me one second. I just got to get my notes together here. Always print out paper just in case the computer won't work. It's there. <sighs> it's like really warm in here. So I took my sweater off. I should like open some windows or something so you guys don't fall asleep. But I promise I will do my best to keep you awake. If you are here last time I preached, I made you like write out stuff and we went through scripture together and it was this whole back and forth thing and then Pastor Clint was like, Mirko, that was the worst thing ever to try to put together the video afterwards because, you know, I'm recorded but none of you are recorded and so I'll try to be a little bit better today. All right. We got it? Good. Let me know. Hopefully this works. I'm uh, not great at, yet at doing these PowerPoint presentations. We'll see. Wow. This is cool. All right, this morning, I, uh, Clint asked me to preach, and I was like, okay, God, where do, where do you want me to go? And then I was meeting with a friend of mine, and he's like, go, go where you have authority. Go where God's calling you to go. So I was just like, Clint didn't give me, you didn't give me any, like, direction. He's just like, go for it. I'm like, Awesome. And so this morning, actually, I'm going to start with this. Randy, it's your fault that I've spent way too much time this week preparing for this message, like way too much time. Because I was talking with Randy like last week, and he was doing his own study, and he was going into the Greek and Hebrew and all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm like a simple gospel guy. I just don't like... I've done the Bible college thing. I did my time doing that. Now I just like, I like to like read the word, like God, tell me what's going on, and that's it. But this week, I nerded out, and I like, I went Greek and Hebrew right on. So you guys are going to learn some Hebrew and maybe some Greek this morning. You good with that? Yeah, there you go, right on. Okay, so let's go to the first slide. So this morning, this is what we're going to talk about. And, and the way we pronounce this word is right there. It's lay bob. Can everybody say lay bob? Okay, that's loud enough. It means heart. That is the Hebrew translation for the word that we see and we read as heart when we're reading usually. Not to be confused with, the next slide, labab, which is just one word over, and it means to make cakes. We're not making cakes this morning, okay? We're not making cakes. We're, we're going to be studying about our hearts. We're going to be learning about labob, which is our heart. Okay, good. All right. So I got this thing, and uh, do any of you have like a life message that God has given you? And just put it on your heart, and everywhere you go, it's like you end up at the same theme. You end up at the same place every time. No matter how you speak about God, you always end up at the same place. For me, it's always about my heart. And it's always about everybody's hearts, right? You guys are laughing because you know it. And, and I'm, I'm going to step out on a limb here, and I'm going to say something that might sound heretical. So you've got to take it all in context with the whole thing, okay? Can you do that? Okay, I, this, is, this is like big saying this, like being recorded and all that stuff, okay? So listen to what I'm saying, hear it all the way through. But this is what I tell my youth and our young adults who we work with often, is what we work through. I say, God doesn't care. You're laughing, it's awesome. God doesn't care. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if you're dealing with sickness. He doesn't care if you don't have enough finances. He doesn't care if you get that boyfriend or girlfriend or that spouse. 
He doesn't care if you get that parking spot. He doesn't care. Look, what's your need? He, do, he doesn't care. Why do I say that? Because he does care, but ultimately he cares way more about your heart. He cares way more about what's going on inside of you than he cares about the circumstances around you. Because the circumstances around you, your finances, your spouse, your needs, done. For God, that's nothing. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills, right? He's got it all. That's not a problem for him. What he wants, and yet what he doesn't take, or what he doesn't do, is your heart. He wants your heart. Now, if you go back, if you go back to Labob there, just if you can, George, for me, the very first one, I kind of missed it there. The actual like definition is, is your inner man, your mind, your will. Your, your heart represents the essence of who you are. Absolutely everything. It's not just like, in Scripture, actually, when I went through the study, which, thank you, Randy, I just totally nerded out way too much on it, um, but it doesn't ever in Scripture refer to the actual physical organ. It refers to the inner man. It refers to the crux of who we are. Old Testament time. We're going to go there. Okay? Old Testament period. The Israelites, it, the, the, the culture back then was an eye for an eye culture. It's tooth for tooth. You do something wrong, you're going to pay the, pay the consequences. The law was the law. There wasn't not really much mercy. And it was like, you yeah, paid for it right away, right? Yeah? Okay, we're with me. Good. Let's go to... Um, um, so, then, so then out of that, like in the midst of that, comes the Ten Commandments. And Jesus gives, or the Lord Father gives the Ten Commandments to Moses on the mountain. You guys read them with me here. Hopefully it shows up big enough for you guys to see. We're into Deuteronomy. It's where we find the, um, find the account of it. I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, I am jealous. I'm a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Still tracking with me? Good. It's a good bit of a passage here. You must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. Observe the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. As the Lord your God has commanded you, you have six days each week for your ordinary work. Only six days. This includes you, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, your oxen and donkeys and other livestock, and any foreigners living among you. All your male and female servants must rest as you do. Remember that you were once slaves in Egypt, but the Lord your God brought you out with his strong hand and powerful arm. That is why the Lord your God has commanded you to rest on the Sabbath day, but not now, just day week. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God has given you. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor, and you must not covet your neighbor's wife. You must not covet your neighbor's house or land, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And there was like 600 more laws that were all, wow, okay. Shall we summarize the Ten Commandments? Do you have it up there, George? Nice, pretty slide. There you go. Internet's amazing what you can find right now. Ten Commandments. Shall have no other gods before me. Shall make no idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't murder your siblings. You shall not commit adultery. Shall not steal. Shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. 
It's quite a list. How you doing? Keeping it? As much as the list is there, as much as those laws are there, I want to talk to you today, and I want to try to prove my point of what I said, that God actually cares more about your heart than about your actions. That doesn't disregard your actions, though. Your actions still matter. But he cares more about your heart. He cares more about what's going on. Okay? Because you can have the actions, and you can do all of these. You can try to do all of these. But your heart might not be in it. And you're actually missing the whole point. You're missing the gospel. You're missing what God wants. So there's this neat thing that happens. Actually, we stop there in verse uh, 21. But if you keep reading in Deuteronomy, um, in that same passage, after, after all the commandments are given, and they're not summarized nicely, right? Then there's this exchange where the Israelites are talking with Moses, and they actually encountered God's voice from out of the mountain, from the mountain. His voice came and gave that long bit that I just there, and they got it. And you know what happened to them? Some of them beat their pants, I bet you. They were afraid. They were struck with fear. They were struck with an awe of the Lord. And they said to Moses, wow, like we got to meet with God face to face and yet we're still alive. This is too much for us. Moses, now you go talk to God from now on for us and come back and tell us what he says to us and then we will follow that. But for us to come face to face with God again, we, we, we can't do that. We'll burn up. And you know what God's response to that is? It comes in verse 28 and 29. The Lord heard the request you made to me. So this is Moses now speaking to the Israelites. And he said, I have heard what the people said to you, and they are right. God says that his people are right to be afraid of him, to have fear, a holy fear. Oh, that they would always have, everybody say the word hearts? Hearts like this, that they might fear me and obey all my commands. If they did, they and their descendants would prosper forever. God is after the heart posture. This is just after all the commands are given. All those commands are just given, the Ten Commandments. We know them, right? Ten Commandments. And then God goes, if only their hearts were after me, then I would be with them. Then I'll be with them. Uh, it's like, if they fear me and if their hearts are after me, I can't remember the slide. I don't have the slide before. Can we go to the next one? Uh, no, you skipped one. Are you in Genesis 22? There we go. Genesis 22. This picture does not properly convey the story, but it's the best I could find, so I thought it would be fun. This picture is a story in Genesis 22 where Abraham... God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son. This picture does not display that. You know, you type in like, you know, father, son walking together with firewood or Isaac sacrificing, uh, Abraham uh, sacrificing Isaac. It just doesn't come up with any good pictures. Um, so anyways, this will stick in your mind. But the point is, did Abraham refuse his son, his son. God asked him to kill and sacrifice his son. Abraham's God is so big. God has all of Abraham's heart. That's the only way that Abraham could do this because he fully trusted the Lord. He had given him his whole heart. 
And he cared more about God than he did about his own needs, his own desires. Like, come on, this is huge. Where are you at? What's one of the things that you prize most in your life? And if God came and asked you to sacrifice that today, it's your job, it's your spouse, be grades at school, I don't know what is it. If God comes and asks you, because this made no sense. It made no sense. Isaac was the promise. Isaac was God's promise. It made absolutely zero sense cognitively, made no sense for Abraham, for God to even ask Abraham to do this in Abraham's mind. just made no sense. But Abraham's trust in the Lord was so strong. He had given him his innermost man, his heart, his whole being. He'd given that to God. So he trusted him enough to go, okay, I'm going to do this. What is God asking you today? Do you recognize that without him, you have nothing? Do you have all your eggs in one basket? Do you have all your eggs in Jesus? Are they all there? Or are you holding a few off to the side for yourself just in case? Now we can go to Samuel 1. 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 7. Um, Samuel priest has been asked to go anoint a new king. And so he goes and he sees all of David's brothers and he gets there. Are we there? Yeah. So when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab, which is one of David's brothers, and he thought, surely this is God's anointed. This is it. This is the man. He's good looking. He's got the stuff going on. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. Why would God reject somebody who's got a great appearance, a great height? Because the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the... Just, just as a side note, I've been working on this for over a week now. Yesterday, it finally dawned on me. I'm sitting there, and I go, it's Valentine's Day this week. It's like we're a few days away from Valentine's, and God's given me a whole message on our hearts. That's kind of cool. So just an aside. Isn't he a good God? I, I love him. He's so good. All right. Um, so then another, like, just, I might go on a tangent here. I'm going to sort of try to watch my time. Um, but I still got like an hour and a half to go, right? <laughs> Perfect. All right. So, so, so this just kind of, kind of like just, you know what? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, um, yeah, just show how much sometimes I don't catch on to things. Well, maybe you didn't catch into it either. Um, I'm reading through, and it's like, who was born in Bethlehem? Jesus, right? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Guess where David was also born. Bethlehem. I never clued into this. Sorry, you're all looking at me. Anybody else? Is that new? Like, I clued in. David was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Super cool. Anyways, um, sorry, I got some tangents. Just a real quick, let's go, go through. I just, I love looking at maps and genealogies and that kind of stuff. So here we go. We got timeline. I'm going to look at this a little bit while I, why I do it. So your timeline is hopefully mostly accurate, right? And there's, there's some tolerances in there. But beginning of the world, right? Creation. Adam, we got 4,000, okay? And then from Adam to the flood, which is? Who's the flood? No. Noah. There you go. There you go. They're with me, okay? Okay. Is, is almost 2,000 years, okay? And then you got... Tower of Babel in there. But then from the flood to Abraham is another thousand years. Then from Abraham to Moses is about 500, three to, three to 500. Then from Moses to David, 
it's another three to five hundred. And then from David to Jesus, it's a thousand years. David was born in Bethlehem a thousand years before Jesus. That's cool. That's God's story all throughout. Okay? And then you go from the cross to us is another 2,000 years. So if you look at the section from the cross to us is 2,000 years, and yet from the flood to the beginning is 2,000 years. Now we go to the next slide. Probably not big enough for you guys to see. Sorry. Can I do that to it? It's not working. <laughs> right? But it just shows... The people that are in there shows where the flood is. And now you can picture from Adam to the flood. That's, that's 2,000 years. And from the flood down, I, where did I put it there? You guys, we went over it. It's just kind of cool to see. But then you've got David to Jesus. If you can see it right at the bottom there. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's like David is right here to Jesus. That's 1,000 years. Anyways, I don't even know why I nerded out on that. I'm sorry, but it was just kind of fun. <laughs> Oops, there you go. Thanks, George. There is um, so much, so many cool resources online. Um, I found this other one. If you're interested ever in studying this, it was... Uh, a website called Bible Hub. I don't know if you use that one, Clint, at all. Bible Hub, like, you just type in, like, Hebrew scripture, and just Bible Hub pops up, and you can do these searches where you just go into one word, and you're just like, wow, this word is throughout scripture, and this is what it actually means, and this is how it comes. But it's also, they've got this, this genealogy list, and it's, I was going to print it out, but it's 17 pages, so I thought not, but it goes through all of Scripture in timeline and ties in the Scriptures and the passages with a timeline of where everybody fits in for that whole 4,000, 6,000 years, wherever we're at. 6,000 years, yeah. Um, sorry, are you guys with me? Yeah? Okay, good. Let's get back on point, Mary. Go back on point. So what am I talking about? God cares most about your... Because ultimately, you're going to do what's in your heart. Ultimately, you're going to go the way that you're bent, the way that your inner man, your inner person is geared. That's the way you're going to go. Those are the choices you're going to make. You're going to follow your heart. And God knows that. That's why he's going after your heart. And then just before David, that First Chronicles 28, just before David is about to die, he's passing off his, his, his kingdom. He's passing off, off his, his, his authority as king to his son Solomon. And this is what he says to him. He's, Solomon, my son, learn to know the God of your ancestors intimately. Worship and serve him with your whole heart. It's pretty quiet on this side. Whole. There we go. And a willing mind. For the Lord sees every heart and he knows every plan and thought. If you seek him, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. And we go to Proverbs 23, 7. Um, the rest of my passages so far have been uh, NLT. This one I brought up in uh, New King James. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says, but his heart is not with you. In this translation, heart is actually, uh, let's see if I, nefesh. Randy, this is just like crazy. It's awesome. Okay, it's actually nefesh. Okay, but nefesh as well just brings more life to this whole word. It's, it's, it's our soul. It's our living being, our life, our self, our person, our desire, our passion, our appetite, our emotion. It just brings more meaning to the word heart, doesn't it? Right? All right. So now we're going to go to New Testament. What does Jesus, what does Jesus have to say about all this? Jesus comes on the scene, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven to forty, and Jesus replies. He says, "You must love the Lord your God with all your, all your soul and all your mind." And this is the first 
and the greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of all the prophets are based on these two commands. And here we go into Greek. So we're in Hebrew, and now we're going to Greek. In Greek, the word heart is cardia. Yeah, I say cardia. Cardia, okay? You didn't know you were going to... Cardia, interesting, eh? Okay? You didn't know you were going to learn Greek and Hebrew as much as you did today. Neither did I going into this, so I just get to be brought along. All right? And this, this one has the same general meaning. It is, it is the heart, the mind, the character, the inner self, your will, your intention, your center. And it goes a little bit further, and it says the center and the seat of your spiritual life. Ooh. That get deeper for you? You staying awake? Yeah, good. Good man, good man, good man, right? Okay. And Jesus is talking about your, your inner man. And he comes along the scene and he says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and your mind. He says, this is the greatest commandment. And then he says, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And between these two, he says, if you do these two, what does he say? If you do these two, if you follow these two, you have essentially followed the entire law. How can Jesus come on the scene? We, we were, how, many, how many years later after Moses? 1,500 years after Moses, after God spoke out of the mountain and gave the Ten Commandments, Jesus comes on the scene, and he almost changes it a little bit because it's not written exactly the same as the Ten Commandments. But he says, these two do everything. Why? What's the difference? What was the original Ten Commandments? It was a list of do's and don'ts. Right? You do this, you don't do that. And now Jesus is coming on the scene and he goes, you've missed it. My people have missed it. They've tried to follow all these rules, but they've missed the point. The point was that he wants, he wants what's going on inside of here. He wants you to care what you're doing. He wants you to put all of you into following him because he wants your whole heart. He wants all of you, not just a part of it. Go to Romans 13, 8 through 10. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirement of God's law. For the commandments say, here it is, right? The commandments say, you must not commit adultery. So this is Jesus, right? This, this is like, this is the Lord here. This is the New Testament. This is Paul, sorry. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to others, so love fulfills the requirements of the entire law. Then we go into Matthew 5, chapter 5 through the end of chapter 7. And chapter 5 through the end of chapter 7 is known as the Beatitudes, also known as the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah? And I love doing this one. I tried doing it this last year with work crew, and then we had an injury. It was fun. Um, and didn't get to do what I love doing. But I love to take our work crew up on a mountain, because the Sermon on the Mount, the, the stage is set that Jesus is up on a mountain. That's kind of how it sort of reads. And, and Jesus is there teaching people. And I often will take the worker up there, and, and I like just doing this portion out of the message normally um, with the youth because it just kind of comes alive. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is, is Jesus, and he's, he's talking with, with disciples, but not just his small group. It sounds like he's talking with a big group. And, and he goes through stuff that they've known from the Old Testament, and he like, 
he like tears down what their, what their thoughts are of it. Because they thought, like, if I just did this, if I didn't murder Jonathan, then I was good with God. But inside, they're thinking, man, I hate that guy. I just, I wish he would, like, just, like, I don't know, let's try to think of some kind of devious way that he would die, and they're thinking this up in their minds, but they thought they were good because they didn't actually kill him. You're good. We're good? Okay, we're good. And Jesus, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he just starts to tear down this stuff. It just, it just all comes out, right? Um, we'll skip through. We'll, we'll, we'll go through these quickly, see if you guys still track with me. Okay, so he teaches about the law, 517. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish this law. Oh, there it is. He didn't come to say, yeah, it's okay, just go ahead and kill him. No, 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 no. He actually takes it a level up, right? He takes it a level up. No, he says, I didn't come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Okay, 5, 21 through 22. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. Well, here it is. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with somebody, ooh, dang, been angry with somebody this week? A few honest people in the crowd with hands up. You are subject to judgment. If you call somebody an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Man, he just brings that up a whole nother level. This is serious. Why does Jesus go there? Why? Because he, like I said in the beginning, he doesn't care about your actions. Well, he does. But he cares so much more on what's going on behind those actions. Why are you making those actions? What's the motive? What's going on inside of you? Right? Yeah? Good. I got them with me still. That's good. All right. Um, where are we at? 5, 27 through 28. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in your heart. Whew. Pornography? Is God asking you to give it up? You trust him? Yeah, I went there. Matthew 6, 5 through 6. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who pray publicly on street corners, in the synagogues, everywhere they can be seen. I tell you the truth, this is all the reward they will get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you. Pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. Are you just a Sunday Christian? Or a Wednesday? Or Friday night? Friday night, through three? And then at school, you're a whole different person? Or at home, you're a different person. At work, you're a different person. Matthew 7, 1 to 2. This is the last one we're going to pick out of the Beatitudes. I'll just kind of just give me a snapshot all the way through. Don't judge others or you, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standards you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Now we're going to go on to Timothy. This one's, yeah, this is a good verse. It's a good passage. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. I believe it's Paul. Is that Paul? Paul talking to Timothy? I think so. I didn't look into it deep enough, but I'm pretty sure. And, and he's, he's given Timothy some instructions. As you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. Are we going through difficult times these days? Or is it all peachy? So peachy. Everybody's like, yeah. It's not that peachy, right? It's difficult times. It's always been difficult times. It's life. It's difficult. It throws curveballs at you all the time. People will love only themselves and their money. Ooh. See that? Maybe a little bit of it's you. A little bit of it's me. Love only myself and my money. 
and then be boastful and be proud and scoffing at God. Ooh, I'm going to just go on a tangent. Yeah, I think I've got time still. Go on a tangent. I was, I was looking up the, the Ten Commandments, and then I went on this whole tangent on, like, what do people out there think about the Ten Commandments? And somebody had gone through and listed off all the Ten Commandments. And, like, love the Lord your God, tell your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He's like, doesn't apply to us today. Not mandatory. Boom, starts listing off. Doesn't apply. There's no law against it today. It's kind of what he's saying. There's no law in our society. And there's three that he picked out there's still a law against. Do not murder, not steal. One of the other ones. But it wasn't even, the coveting one wasn't even in there. Like, wow. How far have we gone in our society? God has, Jesus didn't come and abolish all that stuff. No, he came and brought it up a whole level. If you're, if you're a Christian, you're, you're walking the harder road, right? You actually step it up. You can't just lazy. You guys, you can't go lazy through life if you want to be a Christian. If you want to be a follower of the Lord, seriously, I'm, I'm looking at you guys. You guys, and the rest of you can listen to this. If you want to be a follower of the Lord, you've got to be in God's Word daily. And you've got to eat it, and you've got to devour it like your life depends on it. Because if you don't, the enemy will come and he will steal, kill, and destroy you. And he will take you on roads you do not want to go and take you to places you do not want to go. God's way is hard. And many times, it's, it, many times it sucks. Many times it's like, mm, I just want it. It's hard. And it's narrow. There's not much like, just, just no, it's narrow. But man, I tell you, it is so good. He is so faithful. He will carry you through everything in your life. And you look at others out there and people that don't have the Lord and you go, how? How did you survive that? Job loss, spouse dying, family. Like, like, how did you survive that without the Lord? When you know the Lord and he knows you and he is like your everything, man, You've got so much authority, so much peace, so much power, so much strength, so much love. It's the best way to go through life. And then that's something they get excited about. But take it seriously, guys. Take it seriously. Okay, I'm going to get back to this passage. Sorry, George. Just left you on there a long time. Here we go. They'll be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to the parents and ungrateful. Ungrateful. We're such an ungrateful society. They will, they will consider nothing sacred, right? Like that person's with the Ten Commandments, just like, poof, poof, doesn't apply to me. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others, and they will have no self-control. Is this not what we see in our society today? Like everywhere around us? They'll be cruel, and they'll hate what is good. They'll actually hate what is good. And they'll betray their friends. They'll be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than good. And now here's the scary part, guys. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Now we have to turn the tables and go, is that me? Is that me? Am I just... Am I just acting religious? Do I just go through the motions, but I haven't given him, I haven't given him this? So what can we do? Good to have an answer now, right? Yeah, what can we do? You guys want to know what we can do? I want to know what I can do, right? How do I make sure that I'm not, I'm not one of these people? How do I make sure that I'm not just being fake? Or how do I make sure that I'm not being a hypocrite, right? If you talk to people out in the world, I don't want to go to church, they're all just a bunch of hypocrites. 
we want that? I sure don't want that. I don't want that of my life. I don't want that of our church. I don't want that of our camp. I don't want that of our ministry. No. Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord. Never forget, my child, these things I have taught you. Store my commands in your... Oh, Kelvin, this is so weak. Store my commands in your... Also known as... Oh, there is one. Did we catch the other one? Huh? What was the other one? Cardia. Cardia. That's right, right? All right. If you do this, you will live many years and your life will be satisfying. Do you want to have a satisfying life? Many years? What did I just tell you, right? Store my commands in my heart. So it means you've got to know God's word. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your so weak, guys. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people, and you will earn a good reputation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Don't, don't depend just on this. We need this. We need to get God's word into here, but it needs to make the connection from our heart, from our cognitive knowledge, into our heart. Right? Good, good. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Let your actions prove. Let your actions prove. Let your day-to-day actions prove what's going on in your heart. And ask the Lord to change your heart. Now, here is the cool thing. Can you do this on your own? Can you change your heart? Can you, like, change this broken rotten, dirty person on your own? No. No. No, but we can trust in the Lord. We go to Ezekiel 36. Such a cool promise. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. Can you go to the next slide, George? And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony and stubborn heart. And then the next one, and I will give you a tender and responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. It's surgery time, guys. It's time for a heart transplant. Yeah. It's time to get rid of that stony heart, that stubborn heart, and time to surrender that to the Lord. And God, I want your tender heart. I want your heart of flesh. Why? I'm going to end with this. Why does God care most about our hearts? Is it because he's like this just cruel person out there who's like, well, I just want them to do what I want them to do and they need to do what I tell them to do so that they need to do What does heart on Valentine's Day represent? If you're, if you're going to give your significant other a heart or some roses, what does it signifi- signify? I heard it there. Love. Valentine's Day, hearts, love. Why does God care most about our hearts? It's because he loves you. His motivation, his heart, is love. That's good news. You should be jumping up and down. Yeah. Right? Yeah, do it. Jump up and down. Come on, real quick. Yeah, there we go. Wake up. There we go, right? It's good news. It's all about love. And now I'll tell you something. You can't fully love anybody else or yourself until you have fully given your heart fully to the Lord. Because your hearts are stony. Mine's stony without the Lord. But he comes and he gives us a heart of flesh. He says, now that heart can beat that heart can have a life and it can grow. Yeah? So 
So I'm going to ask you, where are you at today? Young? Old? Young? Where are you at? Where are you and God at today? Have you been acting religious and just going through the motions? Is it just your parents' faith or is it your own? Have you come to a spot in your life where you're like, God, I'm all in? It's not just, it's not just me. Yeah, I'm a Christian. It's like, no, I'm a Christ follower. I live to serve him. I live to magnify his name. I live to make him known. Because when you're in love with somebody and you give them everything, everybody knows. Everybody knows Jeanette and I are married. They know us. So does everybody know in your world? Does everybody know that you're a Christ follower? Are you making him known? And if you're here today, so, so that's my, that's, first of all, that's my, that's my question to you who have walked with the Lord for a few years or for your whole lives. Are you still following wholeheartedly? Because that's what this means. God cares most about your... Have I established that today? Have you got that message? Because you go all through Scripture from beginning to end. It's all about a loving God who wants your heart. He wants all of you. So if that's not you today, get it right. If you're here today and you've, you've, you're like, who is, this? who is this God? Who is this Jesus? Because this sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's a God in heaven who came down to earth and he died on the cross because our hearts are stony, full of sin, full of brokenness. He's like, I need to rescue these people. So he dies on the cross to give us a way to get to him. And then he goes, yeah, I'll just, I'll take that stony heart and I'll do that heart transplant and I'm going to give you this one of flesh that actually works, that actually gives you breath when it pumps. Romans 10, this is what you need to do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to the Lord, Romans 10, 9. If you openly declare, if you just say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You believe in your heart. It's just in your core. You're like, yes, this is it. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead because Jesus just didn't die on the cross. He then rose again, which is the gospel. That's the good news, people. And there is tons of amens and shouting hallelujahs everywhere around, right? Come on, right? He raised him from the dead. If you believe that and you declare that, then you will be saved because then he's going to come and he's going to give you that transplant. And you give him permission. Worship team, you want to come up? And I don't know if you guys, you know what, we're just going to go for it. If you need to get right with God this morning, if it's like, I have been operating with a heart of stone. I know I have. Or if you're like, I have been operating completely without the Lord and I don't know him and I want to get to know him. Would you come up this morning as a, as a declaring out loud? Would you come up this morning? Just kneel at these steps here. So everybody stand. So we're splitting gets ready. And if that's you today, if you're like, yes, I, I want to I show the Lord that I'm all in. Don't stay at your seat. I don't care your age. Don't stay at your seat. Come on up. Say, God, I'm all in. And mark today. Mark today is that day that you go, God, I am in. Here's my whole heart. Valentine's Day is like right there. What a better way to celebrate Valentine's Day here in a couple days, knowing that he has your heart and you have his. 
I'd much rather have his than my own. Yeah, thank you. Lord, we give you everything we are and everything we have this morning. We thank you for your word this morning. God, we just take this time to close off this service with hearts that are grateful, hearts that are in need of you, hearts that need to be surrendered, hearts that need to be softened, hearts that need to be renewed. Thank you for this word. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be toward you. This morning, you heard the call from Brother Mirko to surrender your heart. If you've never done that before, you need to. This is a matter of life and death. See, the heart is the wellspring of life. And we need Jesus. So if you need to get right with God, the front is open. Come on up. Don't be afraid. Come and pray and someone will pray with you.